today uh, I'm honored to present my guest, Max Dauskart. He has been teaching and conducting constellation workshops and individual sessions since 2001. Max also served as chairman of International Systemic Constellation Association from 2015 to 2019. Hi, Max. I'm so happy to see you. Hello, Victoria. It's so good to see you again. We met many times during my ISCA chairmanship time when we had Zoom meetings every once a month and you were a regular participant. Always welcome. Thank you for reminding that wonderful time. I truly enjoyed our meeting. Uh, and, you know, I'm very excited to start uh, this series of interview with you as my very first guest. <laughs> I was wondering who could it be my very first guest of series of interview that dedicated to Bert Hellinger and uh, I let universe to decide um, and I can see that uh, there is some divine order because <laughs> you were in charge of international systemic constellations for several years right uh, and also I vividly remember that workshop where Bert Hollinger asked you to set up constellation for him. <laughs> uh, do you remember that constellation? Yeah, so uh, would you like course, to share yeah. a little Unforgettable. bit uh, what happened? <laughs> okay, now uh, I have to go back this many years, but uh, it is still very vividly in my mind. And I'm so glad to know now that you actually witnessed it because then I don't know that many people who actually witnessed it. So yeah, it came as a surprise that Bird asked me to set up a constellation, including other facilitators. That's how it started. Uh, do you know other constellators, facilitators? Okay, and in my mind, I had uh, five particular constellators I, kn I know and I worked with. And I asked then the representative, uh, people from the audience, from the uh, group uh, you were participating in, uh, to represent these five, but without telling them who, who they are. Anyway, so, and then to my utmost surprise, Bert asked me then, and now you select someone for me, himself, Bert. I, I was flabbergasted for a brief moment. I cannot set you up Bert, in my mind, I thought. <laughs> but then, okay, if you said so, I do it. And then I saw, saw a face almost hiding in the background and I knew this was the right person to represent Bert. And so it went. So that's, my, uh, that's in it, the beginning of that amazing constellation back in, in Bad Reichenhall, I don't know how many, five, six years or so ago, yes. Uh, do you remember some insights you received from that constellations? Do you remember some outcome? I'm not so sure about outcome, but definitely for me personally, the most touching, moving uh, moment was when Bird's representative first bowed, then went down on it with his hands on the ground and eventually lay prostrate facing representatives of uh, seekers or clients there. He lay flat on the ground. That was so unexpected and so touching. I cannot, I cannot describe it any better. So in hindsight, I, I could feel this is the essence of Bird. He did all his work in service for some for something bigger for someone else. Now, by going prostrate on the ground, he showed us that he himself is not important personally. So this is my big takeaway from that wonderful, amazing workshop and that constellation in particular. You describe it beautifully. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, and uh, when I think about that, uh, Bird choose you to set up that constellation, 
probably uh, you met Bert before, probably he knew you, and probably you had uh, a long pass from some point uh, in past to that specific moment. I'm very curious uh, what their specific event or circumstance that uh, made you interested in family constellations. How did you learn about family constellations? <laughs> a couple of words about that. <laughs> oh, you want me to put a, a very long, big story into a couple of words. Okay. okay. <laughs> now <seven>. I <laughs> but, uh, Fine. That's it. No, it's, it's, a, it's a nice question. Thank you, Victoria. I heard the name Bert Hellinger for the first time about 25 years ago. A friend of mine had attended a workshop done by uh, another practitioner, and he said, in a very different way, something, I, uh, this last weekend, I attended a workshop and I have to tell you about it. And the way he talked, I knew this is special. Now there's something in it for me, uh, to uh, a message for me. That's what I clearly heard him. And then from then on, I learned about the work and Bert Hellinger only uh, theoretically, uh -huh. only when I, uh, some time later, uh, some years later, I could for the first time actually uh, go to a workshop, attend a workshop. So you, would you like me to <laughs> then tell you uh, a little bit about that first workshop? So, because uh, it was very significant, of course. Yeah, I'm just uh, want to uh, repeat again. Uh, do I understand correctly? You were interested in uh, different modalities uh, for your personal growth, for your spiritual growth, right? And uh, that's probably why your uh, friend uh, uh, invited you or present, uh, kind of uh, introduced family constellations to you because uh, he knew that you might be interested in that, right? That's correct? You are very intuitively, Victoria. That's exactly <laughs> what, what preceded it. Yes, Thank wonderful. You. Okay, so now uh, your first impression. That workshop. Someone, someone else set it up for me. He said, go to this woman. She is doing family constellation workshops. And I did it because I knew a little bit about it and so on. And so I went there, witnessed the first constellation and then in the second constellation, I was chosen to represent. So after witnessing the first um, constellation, and then in the second one, I was chosen to represent a man. And this was a man who was one of 10 children in his family. And five of these 10 had died already, were not living. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So I was standing there between the other five living ones and we are seeing looking opposite us at the five dead ones all ten of us were represented none of us knew the real people we were representing we were sort of standing in their shoes so to speak which is a sort of another term so in that constellation uh, and particularly in the representation for me, something happened, something prof very profound happened. I was feeling such a new sense of sadness. I never felt this sense of sadness before in my, my life, not at all. I was just oh, feeling, but then I could feel my living siblings next to me. And that helped me a bit you know, to, to stand, keep standing. But I've, I really wanted to go to the other ones who are dead already. I felt so close to them. And the facilitator probably asked me a question and I talked about that. So that was my experience, my first experience of uh, representing. And after the workshop, something amazing happened then. The next day or so, I sat by myself very comfortably in the chair and then it fully dawned on me that what I was representing, the person I represented 
or the situation was exactly like my own life situation. I am one of six children of my parents and three of these six are dead. Two actually were died before I was born. Now two older brothers, they died before I was born. And the youngest died at age 16 when I was about 21. Oh, and I was sitting there and then I remembered a little bit uh, the situation of the representation, how good it felt, at least having the living ones on my side. And so I, in my mind, then I saw my two older brothers, first two born, then came my sister, my older sister alive, then me, number four, then my younger brother, number five, and the youngest, number six. So I could feel being in the middle, in my right place in my family. Now, I'm no longer the, the, the oldest boy in the family as I thought when I was growing up, you know, because despite knowing that there were two ones who died, but that was just a story, you know, it didn't really mean much. But now after this representation, Oh, it meant so much and I could feel, yes, they are with me and I am here. This is my place. So this is, for me, uh, was kind of the, the, <laughs> the big event in my life that really then uh, determined the, uh, or helped very much to determine my future uh, path in life. Because after that workshop, I, I ch could change and then devoted my complete life to learning more about it and to towards becoming a facilitator so oh my gosh. thank you for sharing this story you know uh while you were talking i had a goosebump <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's impressive and uh um it looks like these constellations was uh especially for you even though you didn't know about that in advance <laughs> right yes uh, and uh I know that a lot of people do not understand how it works, and uh, I don't think we are in a position to explain that uh, uh, scientifically, uh, but we know it works. And uh, uh, I want to ask you, when you represented that man and you um, had uh, this sadness within you, could you recognize that it's not yours? Uh, I mean, could you separate your personality from personality of someone else? Oh, look, Victoria, this is a great and very basic, uh, basically important question you're asking. That's really what the consolation work is mainly about. Representing is... <sighs> And maybe it helps a number of people who haven't heard about it before to uh, remember the term channeling. No, uh, the, the channeling was the big thing some time ago. No, and we were we were told oh, only very gifted, special people they are able to channel. No, <laughs> to to bring another being and to sort of and speak on their behalf, so to speak. No, this kind of channeling was very much in vogue, and representing is exactly the same and i know as a certainty it's not the special gift for the special ones no we all have the ability to represent and that is brings me to that really major uh, feature of the constellation work which is that while we represent we are kind of in a dual state we mainly give our body, we lend our body to represent a certain person who may be alive or who may be dead, doesn't matter, and resonate with that uh, person's feelings or emotions and so on. We are kind of channeling that person, yet we don't go into a trance. No, it's not that we, oh, we are totally oblivious of what else is going on now. We are doing it consciously. We consciously lend our body for that kind of uh, uh, representation or channeling or resonance. But a part of us is clearly uh, awake and conscious. And even sometimes in the course of the representation realize, oh, this is sort of a little bit like my own story and so on. So we have that uh, 
we work on <laughs> very often on two levels. So that is a great, great advantage of, of the work uh, by way of, uh, let's say, practicing our intuitive facilities by way of being a representative. That's, that's maybe. A yeah, bit more. that's a great explanation. And uh, I love how you uh, put in words that because it's really hard to explain what the family constellation work is. And for many people, it's kind of looks weird. Uh, <laughs> it looks like people play their roles. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, for uh, outsiders, uh, it's definitely like a theater, right? Like a stage and someone uh, created this uh, play. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, clarifying that for people and uh, I love what you said that it's not yeah. just specially trained people it's for everyone everyone can feel that everyone. exactly exit then please uh, Victoria let me say a little bit more in that uh, context yes uh, what it what it is based on you now and uh, where is the information we are kind of tapping into when we are representing or channeling or and so on. So obviously we do tap into a pool of information. That's clear, no? that obvious. But where is it? And I really like the uh, modern technology was teaching us like this Zoom uh, meeting is being recorded. And where is it stored? It's stored in the Zoom cloud. That's where it's stored, in the Zoom cloud. So the Zoom cloud is huge, but it is a physical entity and it's, it has its limits. No, it's not uh, forever. Right. But the ancient Indians, they taught us a few thousand years ago that there is something they called Akasha. Uh -huh, Akasha, yeah. and many people know the term Akashic records, reading the Akashic records, right. that's doing that. So Akasha has been known for many thousands of years as the cloud, it's more than a cloud, that is somewhere where everything is stored, every information ever given. And where each one of us uh, is connected with, with each one of us being alive or dead. It doesn't make a difference. So we're tapping into this Akashic field or in the constellation context, it's often called the knowing field, but it's the same. No? The Akashic field is really the, the big uh, cosmic field where all information is stored. And so that I think that's good to have that in mind in context of representing. Yeah. Uh, I, I love this comparison, uh, and uh, when I think about this computer thing, cloud, it's just mm -hmm. uh, something uh, very, very hard to understand uh, yeah. to not specialists. Mm -hmm. So I, I love it uh, how you <laughs> connected these two uh, concepts to family constellation. It makes sense to me. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Well, um, these uh, theories of interviews, um, I call that orders of love for success in life. And now uh, I would like to ask how we can relate orders of love to family constellations. Are they related or uh, that's something different? <laughs> well, they're certainly uh, related. But when you ask me about orders of love, instantly what came to me in that moment was thinking of the orders of our origin almost. Now that uh, it connects me to the fact that we are not just islands for ourselves, but we are connected to our parents, grandparents, and all the ones before them to that great pool of humanity. And this really is the order, you know, that uh, the first ones uh, were, whoever the first ones were, <laughs> were, we don't know, but we let's say we go back 10 or 20 generations, that's enough now. They created something and they were able to procreate, that means bring in uh, the next generation into being and so on and so on. So this is the basic order. And this is so important. And in our work, we are again and again reminded of this uh, line of uh, or this order 
And <laughs> now it brings me to another experience I had through the work uh, about my roots or my, or, uh, my origin or my uh, ancestral origin. Mm -hmm. uh, can I? <laughs> I yes, think I, please. I, I, uh, yeah. Okay, because yeah. it, I think it's significant and it, it would make sense to more people. Uh, it was in a, actually an online uh, group workshop. Uh, uh, after, after meditation, we were put into breakout groups of four. And in that breakout group, we were asked to simply report what came out of our meditation on the questions, where are my roots? Mm -hmm. That was the question. And when it was my turn to answer or to, to, to report, I was almost surprised by myself when I said, I am a Memelander. I am from the Memeland. <laughs> I had to stop for a moment. And I tell you bef before I continue that story, I was born uh, a few years after World War II in, in what was then West Germany mm -hmm. from my par uh, refugee parents. My parents were refugees. So, and I grew up there and I thought, this is my home. You no, know, where I grew up is where, uh, where my home is, so to speak, normal, you know, and so on. But in this moment, uh, uh, when reporting on my meditation on where are my roots, and it came out, I am a Mamelander, I am from the Mameland. And then I explained to that uh, small group what the Mameland is. The Mameland is a small part. Uh, no part uh, uh, geographical area, no, no part of Lithuania. So back then it was, or for many centuries, it was part of East Prussia, again, part of greater Germany. So I, uh, all my ancestors, my parents, and even the two older brothers I just mentioned a moment ago, they were born there in the Memelan. That means that is uh, to the east of uh, Kaliningrad, Königsberg, mm -hmm. in what now is Lithuania. No? And I knew it all my life that this is where they're all from, but it didn't, didn't make sense so much. No? And in the course of my uh, consolation experiences and so on, culminating in this moment when we were asked to report on where are your, my roots, no, this came out. So I am a Mamelander. And the effect it has for me is just enormous. No? It, it has, okay, now I'm clear about my, what I consider my home in West Germany. So I consider myself a German and I am sure mainly a German, yes. But I most of all, I'm a Mamelander. So, so that gives me oh, a sense of pride and a sense of belonging and a sense of, yes, this, this is where my roots are. So that, and I, I'm sure that this is important because so many people, particularly in your country, uh, they're all migrants. Now, everyone is virtually a migrant apart from the, of course, the, the uh, native population. Now, everyone is a migrant. And so where are the roots? Now, that is uh, the uh, constant question coming up in the course of a workshop. And it helped many uh, participants of workshops to actually, yeah, go and find out where are my roots, no? and so on. That gives peace of mind and so on. Oh, please. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I, uh, I completely agree with you. And uh, uh, I would add that uh, this uh, understanding and accepting uh, that country that gave uh, birth to, to you, uh, to your siblings, uh, also create these feelings of wholeness mm. uh, because uh, it, it expands something within. Exactly. Otherwise, uh, a lot of people have uh, feelings like, for example, guilt after uh, immigration and they cannot find uh, uh, reasons of uh, this feeling, I mean, the cause of this feeling. Uh, uh, I know that's a huge topic. I know that uh, we can uh, create next event and discuss uh, how immigration um, affects, probably uh, how immigration might affect people's life. life. Oh. Uh, uh, 
but uh, I I love what you said, and I'm I'm with you, and I'm very <laughs> happy to know that you were able to discover that uh, for yourself and have this uh, wonderful um, expansion and feelings and satisfaction and. Uh, uh, now you can embrace several countries, right? To keep in, uh, to have these countries in your heart. Uh, and uh, this acceptance, uh, I believe is um, two-sided. When you mm -hmm. accept these countries, these countries accept you as well. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, now uh, I'm holding um, your article. That uh, yeah, I know that you printed an article in uh, the Knowing Field magazine, right? And uh, this is your personal reflection on the topic of conscience. Uh, I know that uh, it's not the very common topic for discussion. Uh, good conscience, bad conscience. Uh, but uh, a lot of people use words good and bad. That's right, that's wrong. And uh, they do not relate it to conscience, right? Uh, also, in this article, you mentioned very important thing that Bert Hallinger discovered connection between conscience and our sense of belonging or our desire to belong. Uh, would you be willing to elaborate on that, uh, share with uh, our audience something about conscience, about belonging, and uh, how, it, how this understanding might help people? Yes, let me give it a moment. Uh, most of all, what goes to the credit of Bert Hellinger is that he virtually undid the common notion that our conscience is the voice of God inside us. That is what many, many people believe. Now, they think that's what conscience is. God tells me what is good and what is bad. So I do I, I follow God when I do what God tells me is good. And I don't do what God tells me is bad, or if I do it, then oh, I have a bad conscience now because I do something bad. Yeah, so you expect that, punishment, right? <laughs> exactly. No? And Bert Hellinger really clarified this very set of superficial, uh, let's say, notion. He realized that the voice we are hearing in our head is the one we grew up with as children. We were told, you do this, then you are good. And if you do that, then you are bad. No? So that's uh, the basic, uh, basically how conscience is implanted in us, in our head. No? And then we continue our life uh, always to check, is it good what I'm doing or is it bad? But Secondly, but Hellinger realized this is totally connected to, the, to belonging. When I feel I'm doing the right thing uh, and I feel good, then I feel good about my belonging, first of all, to my parents, you know, because they tell me first what is good and what is bad. And later in school, uh, when I do what the teacher tells me is good, then I feel good, have a good conscience in regards to my teacher. And later on, when I, for example, for men who go into the army, when I do what the army tells me is good, then I have a good conscience and so on. So conscience is not something that is stable and once and for all the same. Conscience is always relative to the situation we are in. And most of all, it is relative to our need, our need to belong, because that's basically the biggest need we have, the biggest psychological need we have, the need to belong. Because uh, back in, in, in the very beginning of humanity, a single human being had no chance of survival. Only by belonging to the tribe, the human being has a chance to survive. And that's why the need to belong is uh, so important. And that's why we do everything that our need to belong is fulfilled. 
I think that uh, many words, but I hope that. Right. So, gives... in other words, uh, what you say that uh, uh, conscience, this is some sort of indicator. Uh, do I have right to belong? Is it safe for me do you think to belong? Or uh, if I do something wrong and experience bad conscience, it tells me that I can lose my right to belong. And that's uh, if I feel that, oh my God, uh, I, I might be excluded from this group, then I immediately find a way how to bring myself back and make sure that I belong. And then I ha ex have this good conscience that telling me, oh, just relax. <laughs> you No threaten, you belong here, right? And uh, I would like us to uh, say a little bit more uh, about that because uh, it has, uh, sometimes it might have very, um, uh, ugly consequences, uh, especially when- <laughs> not, you... not only sometimes. <laughs> uh, so what type of consequences? <laughs> well, basically the worst consequence of that is war. War is always uh, pursued by both warring parties with a good conscience because each side believes things they are right and the other side is wrong. And so it's, it's right to be at war with the other side. And then subsequently it is right to kill with a good conscience. That's possible to kill with a good conscience because I know I'm right. God told me that this is the way it has to be. And so the other ones, they are bad and they need to be killed. So we have, countless, countless examples in history of this kind of happening and every warfare. So everything like that, uh, every distinction between good and bad actually is uh, a question of conscience. Now it's connected to our conscience. Is it? Yes. And uh, I, I love uh, uh, your observation that in history, we have a lot of examples when uh, people just try to protect uh, their beliefs, their uh, religious beliefs, their cultural beliefs, and uh, uh, they assume that everything that they learned before that's right, and uh, someone on the other uh, side of the fence doing <laughs> everything wrong, uh, or they, yeah. uh, they just do not understand something and they're dangerous, and yeah. the best way to uh, fix the problem, just get rid of these people. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's really, I would say, extreme situation. Uh, however, I think in, in real life, um, I mean, in daily life, uh, even relationships, couple relationships, right? When uh, man and woman met different uh, families, they also have this kind of... Um, uh, they might have some sort of conflict because everyone has own uh, conscience, right? I mean, they came from different uh, environments and they have these different goods and bad and uh, exactly. have to find a solution, how to mm -hmm. uh, negotiate that and find consensus mm -hmm. to, to, to continue and uh, create own family uh, with already new sort of uh, understanding what might be good and what might be bad, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, then when you uh, say that, no, then let me just add to it. And I think in the article, I, I mentioned the example of two families not being able to come together. And in one family, it was Romeo and the other family, it was uh, Juliet. No they were not allowed to come together because the two families were at war with each other. And then tragic happens and tragic means a, a conflict that can only be resolved by deaths. No? So that is the unfortunate frequent occurrence. Now frequently it happens now that uh, 
uh, people from different cultural backgrounds or different, even you know, similar backgrounds, but like in Romeo and Juliet, they were both sort of pretty much the same, uh, uh, from the, coming from the same society, but still bring war, bang, can, you cannot have this one. Okay, then. Yeah, uh, I love this example. And I remember it was uh, uh, like a exercise when we had uh, two different families and we can experience these dynamics yeah could uh, uh, feel how people on other side they are different and uh, we didn't feel good about them yeah it was a great observation i love it <laughs> um, so uh, back to orders of love when we talk about orders of love for me we talk about uh, something some system that wants to be uh, whole like a body uh, can function when all organs work together in unison, right? And uh, family system also, like uh, our body, similar to our body, uh, work in unison. And if uh, we, for some reason, because we believe that something bad uh, and we might want to exclude a bad person, the system itself uh, wants to keep this wholeness and uh, then family members can uh, suffer because of this exclusion, right? Uh, and uh, Orders of Love tells us that everyone has equal rights to belong. However, uh, there is a, some conflict between how we understand we're supposed to act when some someone works, someone act uh, in negative way. On the other hand, we violate orders of love, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there is some solution to that. Okay, uh, what I understand you uh, saying is you're talking about what in the constellation work is called entanglement. Yes. Entanglement arises out of what you said, someone is being excluded because he, he or she was the bad one, the black sheep of the family or whatever. And, and everyone tries the best to forget that person and not talk about that person. But as you said, the system as such does not forget. The system knows it and it's a system, family system, we call it, that makes sure that this person is not forgotten, but in a roundabout way, not in a direct way. And the roundabout way is what we call entanglement. Now the system makes a future member of the family, no, a, a later, I mean, a later member of the family, uh, kind of represent that excluded, formally excluded person. That could be by developing an illness or by developing a certain habit, or, which is then turns out to be similar to that bad habit the other one had, or could be a drug addiction or so, no, and whatever. No, uh, that uh, is what we call entanglement. But it, entanglement, only the system kind of knows that it's entangled, but right. the person is not aware of it. That is a sort of almost tragedy. That is a very difficult thing. The person who is entangled with someone excluded is not aware of it. But that's where our work can and has helped countless of times that we somehow manage to connect the current member of the family who is suffering whatever uh, symptom with that excluded person. And then by represent uh, having that excluded person represented and having the this, what I now call the seeker, now the one who has mm -hmm. who's coming with a, with an issue, with that issue of personal issue, looking at that at that represent representative of that uh, member of the family, like a great grandfather or whatever, no, and oh, then something happens, no, and that really is always touching to observe that how from first the sense of ah, oh, I don't like this like this man, but uh, after a while, no, uh, the, the seeker can sort of move closer and, and really look at th that one, the excluded one in a new way. And, and eventually, very often, they actually can come as close as hugging 
and and the issue then is frequently resolved. So this is, I think, what you have been talking about. Yes, exactly. It's part of the orders of love, no? Yeah. Yes. So actually, thanks to family constellations, these invisible uh, dynamics become visible and people have an opportunity to reconcile with uh, that excluded member yep. uh, and uh, uh, let that member a special spa space in a family system. So the system as a whole can relax and uh, a relationship in this system become more harmonious, I, I would say, right? Mm. Uh, um, is that an accurate observation? Oh, very good, very good. Okay, Victoria. thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I think we, uh, we discussed many important uh, uh, topics and uh, I know that I have many more questions for you, but our time sort of uh, limited today. Um, let me ask last question, or let me ask uh, if you have some message for the audience, uh, if you want to share something uh, to deliver some important message to everyone who is watching our video today, uh, please. Uh, uh, I basically have given that message by what I was reporting on, but I like then I take the wonderful opportunity to put it into a couple of sentences. Practice your intuition, practice by even mentally, imaginarily, represent someone look at the person you don't like for example and look at that person in a new way now step out of your own of your own self and is and look at that person and yourself almost like from a side and then see if that person still is so such a bad person as before no maybe then uh, you can see oh there's something in that person i haven't yet seen before now when we only uh, look at someone we don't like and say oh i don't like you i don't like you then of course we don't see the whole person so and by practicing representation which we can do any time of the day with anyone we ever meet so this is the one big message and the other is the one about our roots now have a look what where are your roots no where are you coming from where's your where if you can find all of course people who are adopted for example they have very great difficulties to finding that. No, that is just the fact. But even there, it may be possible to, to get some more information and so on. Or, and, but to connect, to be in connection with our origin, with our roots, now that is a basis. And not only look at uh, the negative things we have been given by our ancestors, which is now fashionably called the, the trauma, ancestral trauma is not a big word now. Okay, that's true too. But equally, we have been given all the good things, no? our strengths, our ability, our thinking facility and, and our, our feeling ability and, and all of that. That all came from our ancestors as well. So to, be, to connect with our ancestors, with our roots is the second big <laughs> suggestion I like to end my talk with. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this uh, amazing, so interesting conversation. Uh, and, you know, every time I talk to you, I learn something new, some <laughs> new aspects, and I appreciate that. So I hope we will meet again and uh, we will continue our conversation. Um, so today... Um, I wish you the best, uh, all the best, and have a wonderful day. And uh, yes. Then let me uh, finish with uh, say, uh, stating my appreciation of what you're doing in, in honor of Harry Hellinger. I, I'm really extremely happy that you are doing it, uh, talking to different, many different consolators and uh, putting it on public view 
in the honor of Bert Hellinger. Now, uh, the, his uh, an death anniversary is coming up soon. And I think that's where you intend to start uh, publishing the, 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 uh, the interviews and so on. So I think that is a very, very wonderful contribution uh, to, the, to honoring Bert Hellinger and most of all to honoring what he has given us. Now, we are, we are not putting the man on a pedestal, no, but we are honoring that enormous gift he has given us. Uh, through his lifelong work. Now, so thank you, Victoria, for contributing. Thank you, and uh, uh, yes, these uh, theories of interviews dedicated to Bert Hellinger, our teacher, uh, this year in Sept uh, uh, September the 19th, it will be two years as he passed away, and mm. uh, we students of Hellinger School and followers of Bert Hellinger really would like to share with the world uh, those knowledge and experience that we received from uh, our teacher. Uh, he wrote more than 100 books, uh, some books translated in uh, English, and uh, I truly suggest to find books and read Hellinger's books because Hellinger considered himself as philosopher and family constellations, this is philosophy of life. And I believe everyone can use this philosophy to live meaningful life. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Max, for this uh, conversation. Thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>